here is where the magic happens. Some of it. Taking the chair here somewhere. Find it. Everything is all tied up right. It's see, crazy right now. I'm expecting a plumber to come here and put a toilet in. And, uh, they actually would, because they have to take everything out there. So it could work. And they have to come in two weeks. Oh, yes. I'm real tired for that. There's some light. Oh, yeah, yeah. I get mad at it. I locked my keys. I locked my keys in here. Oh no! And I couldn't go anywhere. I couldn't use my truck. I couldn't do anything. So I opened it. Of course. Well, yeah. Well, when I can afford a door, I'll get another door. It works. Mark, I'm still thinking about 50 years. 50 yeah. years doing that. That's. I think about it too. That's an. That's an achievement itself. It's yeah, I know. I can't believe it. Yeah, fifty years. Wow. Fifty years. And every. I was twenty-four. Every year, something new. Yeah, every year. And you survived. I did. And you know, and I had some really nice years. Oh my gosh, I had some good years. I used to pollinate apples. That worked out well until it didn't. You know, it's. It beats up the bees, and it beats yeah. up the workers, and it beats up the equipment, and. You wind up moving your <clears throat> your bees into the orchard and back again, and it's not very far. Some of the yards were only 10 miles. I lost a super of honey. Every time I moved a, a box of bees, I lost a super of production that year. Hmm. Um, and it was obvious because some moved and some didn't. You know, so it's pretty obvious the uh, the the average crop from the pollinators and the non-pollinators. And, um, and they wouldn't even pay me enough to replace the honey. I started out, it was $22 a high for apples. Try to get somebody to do that nowadays. Then it was 35 and they made them move them. But finally I said, hey, you gotta give me at least 50. I'm losing a, I'm losing a, a super honey. I'm losing 40 pounds of honey here. And at the time I'd have been 95 or a dollar. You know, I'm losing 40 pounds of honey and you're, not, you're only paying me 35. You got to give me 50. We couldn't give you 50. All right, well then, find somebody else. Yeah, exactly. You know, what are they paying now? I can't imagine what they're paying now. Must be 75, 80 or more. I would say that, yeah. Yeah, and what about almonds? I mean, 200? If you're getting there now, some places, I don't think we've even reached that. Is that anymore. right? But then you got to get them there, and then you got to get them back, and yeah. then you hope they don't get sprayed, and then you hope that they don't get stolen, and then you hope that the truck doesn't tip over. And, and all the diseases in one single place? Right. And I think that's part of the problem. You know, I, I hate to that. say it. I, I, I love my commercial beekeeping friends. I'm, I hate to say it, the migratory guys, except for a few, you know, but... Um, it's got to be affecting the bees. Oh, yes. I have and so they, bring, they come back here. And, then, and they're, they're spread out around us. Is that why the mites are more virulent or the viruses are more virulent? Is that why all of a sudden, no, I don't buy bees, all of a sudden the European is showing up? Yeah. Where's that coming from? You know, I know when, this, when they come back because all of a sudden my hives are full of beetles. Is that right? Mm -hmm. I couldn't bring something in here. You can't bring cows in here that are full of parasites and diseases and brucellosis and all this noise. Or, or even see. nursery stock. You can't bring nursery stock in here. You couldn't bring a hemlocks in here with woolly adelgid. But you can bring bees in here with varroa mites and beetles and who knows what else. 
My experience now, Mike, visiting commercial guys for almost four years now, there is a, the people that are successful, and we need to define successful here. And successful for me is have a sustainable uh, operation that provide you a profit every year, and you have more control of the bees in your life. You're healthier too. Right. The guys that I see success on that are the uh, the guys that are avoiding going to California okay. and, and have more a local and more organized uh, operation. And they have more control. They make less money. I would say that. Maybe up front. Up front, yeah. But their lifestyle, their health, the health of their kids. I, I see a big improvement of like when I look at them. Right. Yeah. That's true. I believe that. And so I think it takes some people a long time to figure it out. That just because they make they get a bigger paycheck doesn't yeah, mean yeah. that they're they, any farther ahead. They're hurting themselves. Mm -hmm. And they're and really their bees. The bees, they're going after the money and they're thirsty. Some of those need and they're desperate. I, I understand that part. Some of those are just going for because of the greed. Right. And and the, they don't really need that. And, and we look at them like, I look at you, you're 74 and you're still sharp as hell mm -hmm. and you're active and you're good. I see some guys with 40 years old that I think they have 65. Right. There is... And they're overweight and they're overstressed they're and destroyed. they poorly. And yes. I agree. They're destroyed. I and I, I don't know how to help. Yeah. Because they are poisoned by right. that greed. You know, if I had to take care of myself at home, I'd, I'd probably be in tough shape because I just don't like to cook. I, yeah. You know, I, I, would eat, I would eat the quickest stuff I could, but my wife, Leslie, she just <laughs> makes sure that we have good food to eat. Uh, and that has really helped a lot over the years. Very important. I, I would, <clears throat> that's what I want to learn from you because I was talking with my wife right now. That's, I want to be like that guy. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be like Mike. <laughs> no. I want to be like Mike. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And, awesome. You know, I really agree with that. So, you know, I, I mean, I get plenty of friends that are commercial migratories, and, and I don't want to slam them. No, no. But it's I, just, I'm just observations over, over the years. It's just like, you're not any farther ahead. And you're going to be dead. You're going to be dead when you're 55 because you're going to have a stroke. Yeah. You know? I, I clearly see that. And I don't know how to touch the subject without piss them off or... Right. Or, so I don't bother, you know? Yeah, I don't, it's hard. I don't come out publicly about things like that, you know, and, and call anybody out. All I do is talk, you know, say my own observations, but... It's my observation too, and I, and I visit dozens now. I spent three years at University of Florida. My work was research dedicated to commercial beekeepers. So I was visiting everybody in Florida, see all kinds of different management systems, approach, lifestyle, and it, after a while it could be, it started to become a pattern. This, the people are more greedy and they're destroyed. They're destroyed. They are. They're affecting their families, relationships, and I don't know how to help on that. I sent bees to Florida once. I sent 400 eyes. They, did. they came back stinky rotten with chalk brood. That's when we first got resistant varroa mites, you know, to Apis Den. And uh, they were 15% hopelessly queenless, and on and on and on, you know? Yep. I mean, why would I ever do that again? I don't get it. I'll figure out how to winter my bees here, and I'll leave them here. You know, one of the greatest, uh, um, uh, the best, one of the best helpers to the, to the queen breeder, to the beekeeper, is winter. Because the winter is the great selector for a good breeding stock. Yeah. So if you can make if it can make it here and be a thriving colony, there you go. There's a possible breeder right there. You know. Well, what do you got if you go to Florida or Georgia or wherever? What have you got? Well, you you're keeping bees in the Northeast. In the, look at this climate. But yet you're going to keep your bees and you're going to raise your bees and all that stuff in the Queens and all in Florida or Georgia. What's that telling you? I can't keep my bees alive up north. <laughs> because you don't keep your bees up north. You know. 
Different managements. I, I see successful guys in Florida, but it, it's different style. It's just, and I'm, I'm, I'm the guy that always preach local bees are always better. Yeah, but, but my bees might going to Florida might not be so great. No, no. If, if you're breeding here for so long, adapted very well here. I send, I send, queens, from, I send queens from Florida to, to Alaska and everywhere in between. And, and people really like my queens. Um, Florida, I, I had some reasonable, um, you know, success with, they have with my queens. But I sent a bunch to, well, I sent them to El Paso, Texas, and they, somehow they made it to Mexico. And, mm. and they said, and the consensus was, your queens are too slow. Well, yeah. Because they want Italian stock that, that builds up these huge colonies. Of course they do. And quick. And they mind wait until the resources are right, and then they build up. Well, that's exactly what I want in a bee. Okay. So, of course yeah. it makes sense to me. You breed for the things you want that is important for you in, in your local environment. Right. Yeah. What's the most, one of the most, maybe the most important thing here, the ability to winter. Because if they don't winter, you got nothing anyway. True. So you got no breeding stock if they don't winter. You know, so, yeah. yeah it's... Mike, I want to take your views on the increased row crops in Vermont. Yep. So what's going on with that? Well, farmers are getting greedy. That's They're up against the wall with their, with their, um, with a, a cost and, uh, you know, expenses and income. Um, so you got to have more and more and more and more cows all the time. Hmm. And you got to feed them so you get the maximum production out of every single cow, even if it's only for a few years, and then they're down the road because you burned them out with all the corn you feed them. This is what farmers tell me. I don't know. I'm mm -hmm. not a dairy farmer. <clears throat> but, you know, when I started 50 years ago, and even, gosh, into the 90s, I would say, um, I tried to figure out when they started using clothianidin in corn. Um, and I would say that's approximately the big explosion of corn growing in Vermont. And I think that was around 2004. That could have been a few years before. But um, before that, there were uh, pastures for the cows to go out and eat and poop. Mm -hmm. And there was, it was full of white clover. Mm, I see. You know, and then they had hay fields that were, you know, alfalfa and, and, and forage crops, you know, and white clover, if the, if the alfalfa started to go bite, white clover came up. White clover is so awesome. The first thing that comes up in a white clover and a white dutch is the flowers. Yeah. And they work it again. A lot of stuff here, they cut it once and it doesn't yield anymore. Ladino, alcyke, they're great flower, but, but you get one crop. White Dutch just keeps coming and coming and coming and coming, and it's and it it's perennial and it spreads by right and you dip the rhizomes in it gets bigger and you know, it's great. So first they plowed up all the hay fields, you know, and and the uh, to grow more corn, and they got rid of all the pastures. They they plowed up the the pastures, took out the rocks and tiled it, and and they don't need pastures because the cows stay in the barn 12 months of the year. They never go out to forage. It's just, it's just stupid. Yeah. You bring your feed to the barn and the poop to the field. Wait a minute. <laughs> what if what's a pasture? <laughs> the cows go out and they eat and they poop. Boom. Done. Okay. So, and then, well, now we've got um, all these fields and but there's hedgerows along the side and they're shading part of the part of the field. So we'll cut down all the hedgerows. Well, what's in the hedgerows? Of course, there's basswood trees. But there's berries and there's sumac. Sumac is one of the most awesome uh, honey crops we have here. It's a delicious vanilla flavored honey. And when you get a sumac here, I mean, it's everywhere. Yeah. It's, it's a weed here. Well, now they're saying it's an invasive. We got to cut it down. You know, like everything else. Oh. So is, that's yeah. the difference now between back then, you know, 30 years ago and now. It's just everything is being turned into corn. There's some, yeah, okay, so there's some, maybe some alfalfa, a little bit of soy, but it's predominantly corn. How we solve this problem, you know? 
Uh, Every industry wants to survive, but some industries, I think, it's more about greed than survivorship at all. Right. Right? Yeah. It's, it's, I, I see some industries in pretty good shape. It's not like the beekeeping industry that's it, it's going down. It's, it, if you don't do anything about it, it's going down. Mm. And, and because they're more bigger, more powerful, and very likely have more people in the right places, they can influence policies in a different ways. So how, 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 can, how can we do something about it? You know? I don't know how we're going to influence the, uh, the agriculture agency here in Vermont. I mean, they're so tied to protecting uh, traditional agriculture, which we aren't part of. Um, I, I don't know what there is to do. I, I really don't. I mean, they lie to us about the pesticides in the corn. The bee lab found um, clothianidin in the tissues of goldenrod plants in August. Well, wait a minute. Clothianidin seeded, treated seed was, was, a pl was planted in May. June, July, August, three months later or more, they're finding it in goldenrod? Yeah. Goldenrod is one of my, one of my bees' main crops for winter. You know, honey and pollen, and they store all that away, and then they feed it to their babies in the spring. Come on. Yep. Don't tell me it doesn't migrate. The, the, the goldenrod never got treated with, with clothianidin, so why is there clothianidin in there? It goes everywhere. So it does, exactly. People need to know those things. They're, they're probably floating in, in chemicals they don't even know they're in contact with. Absolutely.